Matthew chapter 25. I want to uh, begin by just reading one verse to you this morning, verse 21, which says, His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. This morning, I want to walk with you through the parable of the talents. The parable of the talents. Now, depending on what translation you have, maybe your Bible says the parable of the bags of gold. But I'm going to be old school this morning, and uh, I'm going to call it the parable of the talents, okay? Will you pray with me? Jesus, we just thank you this morning that you are in the room. You are in our lives. You are present in every detail. And Holy Spirit, we just invite you to come and manifest yourself in such a way that we are altered, we are changed, we are transformed, we are different having been here today, having sat at your feet, God, having been in your presence. We pray that we would leave this place to do your work because of your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 So I was thinking about the the Christmas play that our kids are going to put on um, next week, and I thought about, you know, growing up in church. I was a church kid my whole life, so I was in very many of those children's Christmas plays growing up. I was in a small church. Um, We didn't have a whole lot of kids, so I was obviously in all of them and played a major role in all of them. And um, I love children's plays because, like, they're the only people in the world that can get away with telling you to pick Jesus while picking their nose, you know? Like, no one else can do that. And uh, they're always so fun. And I was one of those kids for years. Even getting older, you know, as like a preteen and a teenager, I was still having to be in the Christmas plays uh, because we just didn't have, you know, that many kids at our church. And I remember one year uh, a, a song came out on the radio called Christmas Shoes. You know this song? A song came out on the radio, and it was called Christmas Shoes, and it's about this little boy who is waiting in line at a department store to buy these shoes for his mom, and he can't afford them. He doesn't have enough money, and then when they ask him why he wants the shoes, he says, you know, because he wants mom to look good for when she goes and meets Jesus tonight. And then you fill in the gaps, and it's like mom has a terminal illness, and she's going to pass away, and like it is the most depressing song you've ever heard in your life. Life And this song, when it came out, went everywhere. It was on every single radio station. You could not escape it. It was on the Christian radio station. It was on the rap radio station. It was on the rock radio station. Uh, Because nothing says Merry Christmas like a depressing song that hurts you to your core, you know, about terminal illness and a little seven-year-old boy. And so um, I remember that song came out. And now when I hear that song, I'm like, turn it off. Where's Mariah Carey? Turn, give me something else. I cannot listen to that song. But when that song came out, it was everywhere. And I remember our church one year decided we're going to do the Christmas Shoes production. Like, we're going to do, there's a play that goes with it now. And it follows the story of the boy and the mom and the person in the line who meets him. And, and so I remember thinking, like, oh, that's cool, you know. Like, that's cool that we're going to do that. Like, who's, who's going to be the little boy? Because, I mean, my brother was 16, and I was like 13. And that song is about a boy that's like seven, you know what I'm saying? And I was just oblivious to like, oh, I have to be the little boy. Because there, there's not a, lot, a whole lot of little boys in our church, you know. And so I did. I was the little boy who sang about buying his mommy Christmas shoes. That footage has been burned. And, and I played the role, right? I played the role. I thought about that because when you listen and read Jesus' stories, it's really easy to separate yourself from the stories. And if you're not careful, you will think that Jesus' stories are about characters and plot lines, and you won't realize that Jesus' stories are about you and me. Right? Like, These are not just Jesus' stories about the kingdom. These are Jesus' stories about us. Jesus did not just give these stories to us. He told these stories about us. 
And so it's important that we recognize we have a role to play in every single one of Jesus' stories. We are the soil. Like, we are the lost coin. We are the man who bought the field. We are the man who was robbed on the side of the street and they passed by until the Good Samaritan came. Or we are the Good Samaritan who stops for the one who's broken. Or we're the ones who walk over the one who's broken. We're the lost son who's in the world. Or we're the father waiting for a lost son who's in the world. Or we're a jealous brother of the ones who are in the world. Do you with me? Like every single one of us, every single story that Jesus tells is about us. You can't separate yourself from the stories. These are not just Jesus' stories about a kingdom. They're a story about us because we're invited into the kingdom. Amen. So every story that Jesus tells, we have options to choose from. We have a choice to make. Which soil will you be? Which son will you be? Which servant will you be? So in Matthew 25, Jesus tells a story of three men who are entrusted with various amounts of money. Now, I've heard the parable of the talents taught over, you know, a lot of years. And it's usually in the context of, like, money and Uh, financial management and, and, and giving, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's very true. Jesus talked about money quite a bit. But what people most often fail to see about this parable is the context in which Jesus tells it, okay? Uh, it's so important to know where a scripture is because where a scripture is has a lot of impact on what a scripture says, okay? And so, Jesus is telling this parable in Matthew chapter 25, which is right in the middle of what we would consider to be his last sermon before going to the cross. In the book of Matthew, when you read the life of Jesus, he only gives five sermons. We would call them discourses, right, where he just kind of goes on these these rants where he kind of speaks for a long time. A lot of times when Jesus answers questions or when you see him interacting with people, he's very short and succinct. He actually doesn't say a whole lot. It drives people crazy. They want to understand. And he doesn't have much to say. But there are five times throughout the book of Matthew where he actually goes on a journey and he speaks for several chapters at a time. We would call these five discourses. The first one was the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Basically, here's what it looks like to be a follower of Jesus. The second one uh, we could call the mission discourse or the little commission. This is where Jesus sends his 12 out to go and begin doing the work of the ministry. The third one we would call the the parabolic discourse where he starts to tell parables. Uh, This is where he tells the parables such as um, the mustard seed, the sower, the treasure in the field. We went through several of those in this series. The fourth discourse Jesus gives is the discourse on the church. This is when he talks about the lost coin, the lost sheep, uh, the the lost son, right? And then the final discourse is here in Matthew 25 and 26, and we call it the discourse of the end times because this is where Jesus is talking about what's going to happen at the end of the world when he comes back. So if people ever get on to me about, like, preaching the same things, I'm going to be like, well, Jesus only had five sermons, so... Jesus had five. Y'all expect us to get up here every week with a new sermon? Jesus had five. Five, okay? So Jesus goes on this this long dialogue, monologue about the end of times. And it's all because in Matthew 24, one of his disciples asked him this question. What will be the sign of your coming at the end of the age? Now, they had no idea when they asked that question that he was going to go off, that that it would trigger. You ever do that where you're like, you ask a question or you say something to somebody and it just triggers them and they just go? Did it happen for you at Thanksgiving last week, right? You just say something and it sends somebody off? Well, end times is evidently one of those triggers for Jesus because they simply asked him, what's going to happen at the end of all things? How will we know? What will be the sign of your coming? And Jesus goes off on this long discourse for two chapters about the end times. And he begins to give several parables. The parable of the fig tree. The parable of the ten virgins. The parable of the talents. And the parable of the sheep and the goats. And all these parables were aimed at communicating one simple yet perhaps terrifying truth. 
Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back. (laughs) And when he comes back, he is bringing the fullness of the kingdom of heaven. And that means the end of the kingdom of this world. And we will enter into eternity for better or for worse. That's what Jesus is talking about when he talks about the parable of the talents. Aren't you excited about this parable now? Oh, wow, you know. So I want you to look with me at verse 14. I want you to keep in mind that context. This story is in the context of the world is ending, okay? And, and Jesus is telling it in the middle. It's right in the middle of his last sermon about the end times. And as we walk through this parable today, I want to I give you four principles of stewardship. This is a good day for note-taking. If you take notes, great day for note-taking. Um, I want to give you four principles of stewardship because I think this is going to be really helpful for us in life right now, okay? Starting at verse 14, Matthew chapter 25, this is what it says. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. Here we go. Number one, everyone is given something to manage. Everyone is given something something to manage. Now, at first glance, when you read this story, you might think that this is a story about a man lending some money to a few other men who work for him. Let me prove to you why that is very wrong, okay? First of all, this is no ordinary man. And the reason we know this is no ordinary man is because this is no ordinary amount of money, right? If your, if your, translation, uh, your translation may say bags of gold, but it's more accurately translated as talent. And a talent was a measure of weight and a measure of currency that they used at that time. A talent equaled somewhere around 6,000 days wages or 20 years worth of income. 20 years worth of income. So if you do that math, that equates to around uh, a half a million dollars in today's standards. Specifically, if you live in Fayetteville, North Carolina right now, that would be about $540,000. I did the math. You're welcome, okay? $540,000 is what this equates to is just one talent, okay? And so what I'm getting at is that this was a very wealthy man So this was not just a man lending some money to men who worked for him, okay? This was an extremely wealthy man. But he didn't just lend this money to these men. The Bible says he entrusted it to these men. And that's very significant. The Greek word that's used there means to give over into someone's power, like to to allow someone, to empower someone with what you've given them, okay? So he did not trust them with his money. He entrusted his money to them. There's a difference. What's the difference? I've said this before. I trust a lot of people to be around my kids. I would entrust my kids to very few, right? The difference between trusting and entrusting is you can watch my kids and you can shape my kids, You can borrow my car. You can get under the hood of my car and fix it. You with me? You can borrow my money. You can take my money and invest it. That's the difference between trusting and entrusting. He entrusted his money to these men. The difference between the two is stewardship. Come on, everybody say stewardship. Stewardship. What is stewardship? It's management. Stewardship is your ability to manage what has been given to you. And everybody has been given something. Everybody has been given something. So Jesus tells us this parable to let us know you have been promoted into management. Congratulations. You've been promoted into management. When you come into the kingdom, you're in management. That's what Jesus is telling us, is that in the kingdom, we are managers. So this is not just a man lending some money to men who work for him. It's an extremely wealthy man entrusting money to managers. That's what's happening in this story. So I want to tell you that my prayer for you today is that you would begin to see everything through the lens of stewardship. That's what I'm praying for us today. 
Because when you begin to see everything through the lens of stewardship, right, your position uh, at work, everything you have, your position at work, your possessions at home, your influence with people, your skills, your abilities, your talents, these things are not given to you. They've been entrusted to you. You have been entrusted with everything you have. So the question of the day is, what are you doing with what has been entrusted to you? What are you doing with what's been entrusted to you? All of the kingdom, all of the Bible, all of our faith hinges on one revelation. You ready? God is the owner. We are the managers. That's it. And until you understand that, you will never live a kingdom-centered life. You will never live the life God's called you to live. You'll never be the person God's called you to be. You will never fulfill the potential God's called you to fulfill on the earth until you understand God owns, we manage. That's the revelation of the kingdom, right? See, what is the, what is the difference? Owners set the conditions and they create the culture, Right, So when you walk into a Chick-fil-A, they all look the same. Same colors, same menu, same motto. My pleasure, right? They all are the same. And it's because the founder, the owner, he determined, he set a bunch of rules in place, and he determined this is what it looks like to be a Chick-fil-A. <laughs> this is what Chick-fil-A does. And in order to be a Chick-fil-A, you have to do these things. And then he hired managers to do the things that he said needed to be done in order to be a Chick-fil-A. You with me? Right? So, so the manager manages the store, but he does not own the store. He does not own the company. Right? And so this is the difference between an owner and a manager. What am I saying? Everything we have has been entrusted to us by God. It's not ours. Nothing is yours. It's so freeing, isn't it? Nothing is yours, but I worked for it. It's still not yours. You know why? Because your work is not even yours. Your strength is not even yours. Your breath is not even yours. So, so the, the kingdom hinges on this revelation. God owns, we manage, and that means what we do with what we have has to be governed by God. Everything we have belongs to him, and therefore he tells us what to do with it. Austin, you got a wallet? Can I have it? Thank you, sir. Can I have this? I can have it. You know why I can have it? Because it's mine. <laughs> I gave it to him before I walked up here. <laughs> okay? Do you see how easy it is to give up what you know is not yours? That's stewardship. It's recognizing it's not mine. And when it's not mine, I can't hold it back. When it's not mine, I can't not give it. When it's not mine, I can't. Listen, this is, this is the entire revelation of stewardship. Everything in my possession has been given to me to manage, not own. So I live open-handed, not, not to everyone not to everything, to God. Everything I have belongs to God. It's easy to give what you know is not yours. The only time it gets hard to give what's not yours is when you are convinced you're the owner. <laughs> right? So when you see through the lens of stewardship, you recognize you own nothing, you manage everything. So this will affect every part of your life. My money belongs to God. So God, how can I most honor you with how I manage my money? My time belongs to God. So God, how can I most honor you with how I manage my time? How can we not have time for God if it's his? Like, the only way you can't make time for God is if you're stealing time from God. <laughs> it's his, right? If, if my money is God's, how can I manage it in a way that honors you? If my time is God's, how can I manage it in a way that honors you? If my body is God, uh-oh. <laughs> if my body is God's, how can I manage it in a way that honors you? Dang. 
it got quiet. Okay, I just, we just got done with Thanksgiving. You're like, how dare you? How d-? We just got done with our eating holiday. <laughs> oh, but listen, it, it, it touches every part of your life. If everything belongs to God, come on, if my body belongs to God, how can I manage it in a way that honors God? And, and, and this is every part of, our, of, of what we do with our body. I, you know, I've had, heard people say, you know, well, you, you'll let a book tell you who you can and can't have sex with. Now, I'll let the author of the book, who authored my faith, authored my life, and authored this body, tell me who I can and can't have sex with. (laughs) You with me? Listen. Listen. Sexual immorality, abortion, self-destructive habits, the only way that, that those things can be present in our lives is when we're convinced my body is mine. And I can do with it what I want. This is, this is the deception of the kingdom of the world, is to convince you that what you have belongs to you. And therefore you can do it. What is the motto of the day? The mantra of the day is my body, my choice. Right? And from the beginning, this has been the deception of the enemy, that you get to do with what you want, with what you have. And here's the, here's the reality. You have nothing. <laughs> Everything you have has been given to you, right? So we have to first evaluate our lives this morning and ask ourselves, am I living my life as though I'm a manager or an owner? Because everyone's been given something to manage. Verse 15, look with me at verse 15. To one he gave five bags of gold or five talents, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. And then he went on his journey. Number two, first, first thing is that everyone's been given something to manage. Number two, not everyone has been given the same thing to manage. Not everyone is given the same thing to manage. Now remember, a talent is just over half a million dollars, which means the first guy was entrusted with a little over $2.5 million. The second guy was entrusted with a little over a million and the third guy was entrusted with around $540,000. Poor guy. Poor guy. Um, so everyone received a substantial amount of money, but they did not receive the same amount of money. Why? Why? Well, because he could have easily like just added it all up. It would have been about $4 million and evenly divided it between the three. Right? It would have been about $1.3 million for each of them. And it would have been, everyone would have had the same amount, right? But he did not do that. This proves that Jesus is not a socialist, okay? <laughs> no, he divided them up very specifically and gave them to very specific servants in different amounts. Why? It says he gave them according to their ability. Okay, each manager possesses different abilities has different experience, has different skills and talents. Some managers are good with numbers and not with people. Some are good with people, not with numbers. You with me? And so the long story short is that not everyone can be entrusted with the same amount. Not everybody should have the same amount of responsibility, right? And it's not a bad thing. Hear me. Less ability is not disability. Okay? Less ability is not disability. There are times it can be difficult to watch other people have more, accomplish more, uh, do more, receive more opportunities. But hear me, your assignment is not their assignment. So sometimes God will entrust you with less quantity because your assignment requires more quality. You hear me? Um, Several months ago, uh, I, we, I got a call uh, over the summer. Jill and I were on vacation. I got a call uh, to, with an invitation to go to, uh, to Europe and to preach at a conference of young leaders from around Europe and the Middle East. And Jill and I were like, oh, we were so excited because missions is our heart. We've prioritized missions in our life, you know, our entire adult lives. We try to go um, to, to other nations as often as possible and, you know, do, do the work of, of missions. 
and, but we have never been, able, we've never been invited to Europe. And so this was like the first time that we would have the opportunity to do this. I got off the phone. I was excited. I went and told Jill, you know, and for like two days, I'm like, we're going to be, we can do this. And like, we'll, we'll be able to, we can teach this thing together. And we can, you know, just like going on and on about this. And after about two days, it set in and Jill was finally like, Zach, I can't go. No, no, you can. Like, we'll figure that, like, with, we'll, 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 you know, she's like, Zach, the kids cannot make that trip. And, and I knew that. Like, I'm like, too big of a trip, too expensive, too all of that. The kids can't go on this trip. But we'll figure it out. She's like, Zach, it's too big of a trip, too long of a trip. We cannot be away. I cannot be away from these kids for that long. And I was heartbroken. Because I'm like, God, this is not fair. You know, like, And she's like, you go, you bring, bring one of your guys, like, but I, I can't go on that trip. And I'm heartbroken for her. I'm heartbroken because I'm like, this, but the, what, why, Lord, why would you call us into these things and then not be able to give us? And it's because the Lord is communicating to us quite regularly. The most precious assignment I have given you is those two little children in your house. It's the it's the greatest assignment, hear me parents, the greatest assignment, the greatest possession the Lord has given you and entrusted to you are your children. And we can go all over the world and we can preach to all these people and we can try to raise up all these disciples and do all of these things. But if we don't minister to the two children in our home, we failed. We failed. We failed. And, I, and, I, and it was just, it was a reminder that that there are times where what I've called you to is less quantity and more quality. I've given you less. Listen, just because you have less to carry doesn't mean that you haven't been given more. Do you hear me? So not everybody's given the same thing to manage. Each is given according to their ability. And Jesus makes it clear. Look, don't let someone else's assignment stop you from yours, okay? You watch what everybody else is assigned to. Like, Jesus makes it clear. Those who have more, more will be required of them. Right? He says, to whom much is given, much is required. Don't be so quick to want everything you see everybody else has. Because, because the more that you are given, the more that you will be judged with. The more that you will be responsible for, the more weight you're going to feel on your back. So don't be so quick to want what everybody else has or to want what that person has, right? Because to whom is given much, much is required. There's a, a, a great philosopher that once said, with great power comes great responsibility. It's Spider-Man, all right? And it's true. <laughs> it's important to not fall into the deception of wanting everybody else's assignment. There, there's a story in Matthew 15. I think this is so funny. In Matthew 15, there's a story of Jesus feeding the 4,000. Do you know there are two miracle feedings? And, and, and they're within like t- three chapters of each other. Jesus feeds 5,000, and then two chapters later, he feeds 4,000. And the reason you don't you know, a lot of people don't know that is because we don't think that's as cool, so we never talk about it. <laughs> like, he fed 4,000, and we're like, oh, it's an off day for Jesus. <laughs> like, only 4,000, you know? So we only like to talk about the 5,000 one. But there's, there was another one, and he fed 4,000. And in this one, specifically in the 4,000, is when he talks to his disciples. And there's no little boy this time. And there's no, there's no lunchbox. Like, there's, there's, there's not that. So he looks at his disciples, and it's just ridiculous to me that they're like, what are we going to do? <laughs> it's two chapters earlier. Like, you've been here before. It makes me feel so good when I, like, worry all the time about things that Jesus always takes care of, you know. It's like, you've seen him do this before, you know. And Jesus looks at his disciples and he says, how many loaves do you have? And it's this moment where they're having to take count and, and evaluate what do I have, not what did you have last time, not what did someone bring you last time, not what do these people have, not what is back in the village, like what do you have now? It's the same thing that God asked Moses when Moses was like, well, if I go to Pharaoh and what if he doesn't believe me? Mo- God says, Moses, what's in your hand? What's in your hand? 
Not, not, not what could you do, not what did you have, not did you, what, like, what do you have right now? This is the power of stewardship. It's taking stock and embracing what you have right now. Not what you don't have, not what everybody else has, not what do you want, not what could you do if you had. It's what do you have right now. See, it's not about what you don't have. It's about what you have right now. See, the, the, the difficulty is not in uh, being faithful with what you have. It's in not comparing what you have to what everybody else has. Good stewardship is rooted in your ability to embrace what you have and to refuse to chase after what you don't. Not everybody is given the same thing. But you have been given something. And if you will take what you have and put it in the hands of God, he will multiply it. Do you hear me? He'll multiply it. I'd rather have a little in God's hands than a lot in my hands. Amen? (laughs) I'd rather have a little in his hands than a lot in mine. Okay, here we go. Verse 16. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the, one, the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you've entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. And then the same thing happens with the man who had two and made them four. Number three, how you manage anything indicates how you'll manage everything. Everyone's been given something. Not everyone's given the same thing. And how you manage anything is an indicator of how you will manage everything. Jesus says it like this in Luke 16. He says, whoever can be trusted with very little can be trusted with much. Now, at initially when hearing that, it may sound like, well, that's not true because I have a five-year-old that I can trust with a little, but I cannot trust her with much, <laughs> right? But what Jesus is saying here is that the ability to manage grows with the person. So growing as a steward causes what you steward to grow. You hear me? Uh, growing as a manager causes what you manage to grow. Growing as a leader causes what you lead to grow. Leaders, the best thing you can do for the people that you lead is to grow. The best thing you can do for the, the thing that for your job, for your position, for your organization, for your ministry, for your team, for your connect group, the best thing you can do as a leader for the people that you lead is to personally grow. Because as a leader grows, what he leads will grow. And so Jesus is simply saying that if you will be faithful with a little, then you can be faithful with, with much. We most often, though, deceive ourselves into to waiting on some variable to change, though, before we will become more responsible. We'll say things like, you know, well, when I, you know, have a nicer car, then I'll take care of it. Or when I get a, a nicer job, when I get a, a better job, then I'll tithe. <laughs> if you don't tithe on $5, you won't tithe on 5000 Like, you just won't, <laughs> right? Well, you know, when, when, you know, I, I, you know, have this person in my life, then I'll start taking care of myself. Like, listen, it's, it's about valuing what you have now and growing into those things that you, that you dream of. Uh, we, we spend our days thinking about how good life will be when I, we have a certain thing or we get to a certain place or we have a certain someone. And God is saying, like, I can't trust you with that thing. I won't bring you to that place. You won't meet that certain someone because you won't value what you have right now. You with me? And so I've talked about this. You know, I worked, I worked for Harris Teeter for many years. I worked through high school, through college. And then when I moved here, when I was part-time for a while, I worked at Harris Teeter. And great grocery store, pristine 
Um, great produce section. Um, great choice of meats. Uh, anyways, I have a feud with my wife. We fight about Harris Teeter versus Publix. Um, anyways, I worked for Harris Teeter for several years. And I got to be honest, like a great company. I just did, I was, I was done. By the time I was in college, halfway through college, I, I was ready to go into the ministry. I'd finally surrendered to my call in the ministry. And I was ready to do ministry, and I wanted to be done working at the grocery store. And ha- uh, towards the end of college, I tore my ACL, had to have reconstructive surgery, uh, was out of work for a few months. And then when it was time for me to go back to work, I was just dreading it because I'm like, I don't want to be here anymore. God, like, you gave me a, the call into the ministry. Why, are you, why do I still have to be at the grocery store, like, then let me be in the ministry. You know, I was, like, looking for how and when. And listen, I determined, like, I, I would do ministry the rest of my life, whether I'm paid or not. I don't need to be paid. Like, I just want to know that I'm walking in the calling that God has given me. And, I, and, and so I was at this place where I'm like, I just don't want to be stuck at this register anymore. I want to be in the ministry. And I remember in that season of my life, the Lord spoke to me and said, Zach, why would I give you a pulpit if I can't trust you with a register? Why would I give you a pulpit if I can't trust you with a register? And it so rocked me that I went back to work after those few months, and I changed everything. I, I, you know, I always used to uh, write a scripture on my hand every day, but I started to write a scripture on a little piece of paper, and I'd put it on my register, and, and uh, I would sit it there, and people would ask, like, what does that say, or what's that scripture? And then I would get to share the word with people as they went through. Like I, I, made, I became very intentional about I'm going to use my register to share Jesus with people. Not in a, like a, not in a near face way. I wouldn't start conversations about Jesus. Like I was very respectful, but I, but I made it clear you can talk to me about Jesus, right? But hear me, I did not just do that. I also became the most efficient cashier at our store. I was the fastest. I had the least mistakes. They actually keep track of those things. I was on the leaderboard, <laughs> And the reason I'm telling you that is because I think a lot of times we think like, well, yeah, like to be, you know, to, to, to glorify God in our work, like you just share Jesus. Uh, no, you also glorify God in your work by being good at what you do. Like do your job well. Like get there on time. Stay late when they need someone to stay late. Work hard. Do what they ask you to do and go above and beyond. Do it to the greatest ability that you have. Like that is how you glorify God in your job and in your workplace. And for some people it's like, I'd rather just share the gospel. <laughs> Work hard. Right, and so, so it was like, okay, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share Jesus where I have the opportunity to share Jesus, and I'm just going to do my job very well. I'm going to treat this job like it's going to be the job I work the rest of my life. Why would I trust you with a pulpit if I cannot trust you with a register? Uh, fill, in, fill in your own blanks because there's some of you who's like, you've been waiting for God to do a thing in your life, and the Lord is saying, until you embrace this thing that you have in your life right now, I can't trust you with that thing. I can't give you that thing. And it's not because he doesn't want you to have it. It's because that that thing you're waiting for will kill you if he gives it to you at this point. You can't handle that thing that you want right now until you have valued the thing that God has put in front of you. The key is seeing what you have in front of you not as little but as a big deal. Okay, it's only little in hindsight. You realize when, when Jesus says, like, you have been trusted with a little, now I can trust you with much, he's, he's referring to $2.5 million. <laughs> How is $2.5 million little? It's because it was little compared to what was coming. I'm not preaching prosperity, okay? They're like, oh, but somebody in here, you know what? But <laughs> listen, it was $2.5 million and Jesus called it little. Why would that be little? Because compared to what was on the way, compared to what he was being given as a result of his faithfulness, it was little. Listen, the key is you can't see what you're doing right now as little. Right now, it needs to be a big deal. But one day, what you're doing now will be little. Come on. I'm believing for the day. 
I'm believing for the day that we will look back and say, do you remember that little building on Legion Road? Do you remember all those little children's rooms that we used to have in those huts? Come on. Do you remember that old ball field where we used to be? I'm believing for the day that we see what we're doing now as little. But right now, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. Right now, every person that comes through these doors, God has entrusted to us. Every child that walks back to those, those huts has been entrusted to us. Every person that you shake their hand on a Sunday morning, God's given to you, entrusted to you. So we have to see what we're doing as a big deal. Because right now it is. Every time you serve, it's a big deal. Every time we gather in this place and we worship, it's a big deal. Come on. It's only in hindsight that things become small. Listen, the, the good stewardship doesn't have the goal of getting big. Good stewardship has the goal of doing well. I want to do well. People ask, like, well, do you, do you, do you want to be a big church? I don't want to be anything. I want to do well. <laughs> I want to do well with what I've been given. I, listen, well done, good and faithful servant. Well done, good and faithful servant. You know, it, it, it's, you're having to see every single thing, every, every time that you do what you do, it has to be a big deal to you. Uh, in 1961, uh, John F. Kennedy visited NASA space station, and he accidentally walked into the wrong hallway, and he stumbled upon a janitor. And the janitor was like mopping or something. And he asked the janitor, he said, what are you doing working so late? And the janitor looked at the president and he said, well, you know, sir, I'm helping to put a man on the moon. I'm helping put a man on the moon. Now, whether you believe we landed on the moon or we deceived billions of people, it was a big feat either way, okay? The, the, the point is this. That janitor believed what he was doing mattered, and when you have that kind of culture in your job, in your church, in your family, everywhere you go, when you believe what you're doing matters, no matter what it is, it will grow. <laughs> it will be healthy. It will flourish. It will multiply. That's a mindset that God blesses. That's a steward that God entrusts. Are you with me? And so if we can be faithful with right now, we can be trusted with what's to come. If, we can be faith, if you can be faithful with the job you have right now, maybe you hate it, maybe you're so tired of it, maybe it's, 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 it's weary, it's, it's, it's dark, it's whatever it is. If you could be faithful with the season you're in right now, you could be trusted with what's to come. Come on, Will, you can, Pastor Will, you can join me on the stage. Last verses, verse 24 through 30, here we go. The man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you're a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown, gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid. I went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here's what belongs to you. And his master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. You knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags. For whoever has will be given more. They will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Last point, number four, choosing to do nothing is something. Choosing to do nothing is something. It's a choice. Story gets really dark, doesn't it? <laughs> this is why, context, Jesus is in his end time sermon. Stewardship works both ways, okay? Okay. Jesus says, if you'll be faithful with a little, you can be faithful with much. He also says, if you'll be dishonest with a little, you'll be dishonest with much. So your faithfulness will grow with you, and your dishonesty will grow with you. Here's the reality. This will trip you out. 
You can't choose to be a steward. You are one. You were created to steward. You, you don't choose. You will just either be a good one or a bad one. And so either you'll take what you've been given and you'll invest it in the kingdom, your time, your money, your, your talent, your, whatever you've got, your relationships, or you'll take what you've been given and you'll invest it in the earth. You put it in yourself, you put it in this kingdom of the world, you put it in things. Jesus says, whoever is dishonest with little will be dishonest with much. I used to tell my students when I was teaching school, I used to tell my students that when I would get word that they were cheating on tests or quizzes or, or assignments, you know, and I'd wait for them to come in my class and I would just lay into them. I'm like, if you'll cheat on a quiz, you'll cheat on your spouse one day. They would get so mad. No, we won't. How dare you know? And it was a little extreme. I, I like to be extreme, okay, if you haven't noticed. But, this, but what I was saying is simply this. If, you'll be dis, if you have no value for honesty in the small things, you will not all of a sudden gain value for honesty in the big things. <laughs> like you, you, you've got to learn to value something at its smallest in order to find value in those things that really matter. What you do with a little, you will do with much, both good and bad. Hear me, if people will gossip to you about others, they will gossip to others about you. Like, it's all stewardship. You hear me? It's all stewardship. It's how you handle what has been given to you. So the third man took what was entrusted to him. This is why it's important. He's not just a man lending men money. He was a manager. He was given this, he was entrusted with this money to do big things with it. So this is why there's such a harsh punishment at the end of this story. Because this was no man that just like got it wrong or made a mistake, right? And so the third man, he took the, the talent that was given to him and he buried it in the earth. Why? What was his motive? His motive was this, to save himself. It was to save his own skin. That was his only goal. Can I go ahead and tell you, this does not have a happy ending. <laughs> so if you need, like, if you like happy endings to stories, like, you might have to watch a Disney movie this afternoon. This is, this is not end well. This story ends with Jesus describing hell. Someone should tell Jesus it's 2023 and we don't talk about hell anymore in the church. What we do in this church? Because Jesus talked about hell. I don't, I, I, you can't, I, I don't know how you, I don't know how you read the Bible. I don't know how you read the New Testament. I don't know how you read the Gospels. Jesus talked about hell more than anyone. And it, the story ends with Jesus describing hell. Because ultimately, this parable serves to teach two things, two main things. The principle of stewardship and the reality of judgment. The principle of stewardship the reality of judgment. Stewardship applies to every area of your life, like we've said, possessions, relationships, ability, finances. But judgment, judgment is about one thing, belief. See, the bags of gold, in one sense, do not represent all that you've been given. Rather, they represent the most important thing that you've been given, which is a measure of faith. And here's why. Here's why the talents can't represent uh, your finances and your time and your abilities. Like, th those are important. The, the principle applies that's being taught in this parable. But the reason these bags don't represent all those things is because you can mismanage all of those things, and it won't send you to hell. Right? Like, mismanaging what you've been given is not what sends you to hell. You go to hell for unbelief. You don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ that's what sends you to hell. So you can mismanage all that you've been given, and it won't send you to hell. But if you misplace the faith that you've been given, it will. These bags, these talents, they represent the faith, the measure of faith that's been given to every man to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And to believe on him is to be entrusted by him and to take all those things that you've been given, all of the things, all the talents, abilities, and skills, well, 
and to use those for his glory. But it begins by saying, I'm going to receive the faith he's given me. I'm going to place it in him and watch him multiply it. Listen, the reality is every believer has been given a measure of faith, spiritual gifts, and the gospel. What are you doing with those? You may not have as much faith as someone else, but what are you doing with the faith that you have? Have you activated your faith or have you buried your faith in the ground? Jesus is coming back. And I don't say that to scare you. I grew up most of my life scared, (laughs) okay? Pentecostal boy in a Pentecostal church who was in a Christmas shoes program one time. I grew up most of my life, like, scared to death. Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back. Listen, I'm not trying to scare you into the arms of a loving God. It's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. Like, that's what Romans 2 says. But you need to know he's coming back. And when he comes back, he'll judge the earth. And he'll judge you and I. And we will first be judged for whether or not we have placed our faith in him. And then we'll be judged for what we did with what we had. And so Jesus is coming back. And I want to be found doing exactly what he called me to do when he comes. I want to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. I want to do well. I told a story several months ago about a a man who was found in the Philippine jungles 30 years after World War II, still fighting the war. He was a Japanese soldier, still fighting World War II, 30 years after it was over, and he would not lay down arms. He would not stop fighting until they flew his commanding officer out to him 30 years later to look him in the eyes and tell him the war is over. I want to be like that soldier. (laughs) I want to be found still fighting, still burning, still stewarding, still serving. I want to be found doing the things that Jesus has called me to do with all of my heart, with all of my soul, with all of my mind, with all of my strength. Come on. This is what it looks like to be the steward God's called you to be. I'm going to do what you've called me to do until I hear the trumpet sound or until the last breath I breathe. Come on, stand to your feet with me this morning.